Time to go. 11 and 11. This is a talk on the uh, 11 or so new things I have found of interest in Postgres version 11. And uh, being that it's early Sunday morning, I won't promise I can remember all 11 of these. Um, but we'll take a look. This is just stuff that I Googled around and found interesting, so it's not necessarily the most important features, but what I like. And I am a uh, developer, software developer. I've done a career of doing uh, database-backed custom apps for business. Uh, I do Java and Vaadin, and when I do Postgres stuff, it's, I mean database stuff, it's usually Postgres. Um, so Postgres 11 was released late last year. Uh, it's currently at 11.2. And um, there are pretty good release notes. Uh, you know, they're kind of more of a hit list. So uh, part of the benefit of this talk in the slides is that I've got links in here to additional resources on every specific topic. So that alone is probably worth your time to uh, look at the slides, which I don't think I put up yet on the website, but I will. So here's some of the 11 things. Uh, partitioning stuff. There's more stuff that's parallel to use more uh, cores. Um, I'm going to talk about LLVM technology, which is uh, geeky, exciting for me uh, to see that in Postgres. I'll explain some of that. Um, there's some very practical stuff like configuring wall file, the size of your wall file. Uh, and also practical is SHA-2 hash functions. Um, we'll talk about that stuff. And um, a little bit of security stuff. Uh, take a grain of salt with everything I say because I am not an expert on these features and um, I have not even verified that all of these made into the release. A lot of times people are um, documenting stuff that is being worked on but it doesn't always quite make the cut. So um, maybe you'll see this again when I do 12 and 12 next year. Uh, the biggest thing I'll talk about is the partitioning um, uh, and then we'll go a lot faster hitting the other items. So a little background on uh, partitioning. Um, the, one of the key ideas in relational theory was to abstract away the storage. Before relational databases, generally developers actually intimately knew the data structure in storage of their, their data files or data structures, uh, the equivalent of what we call databases now. So it's kind of ironic talking about partitioning because the whole idea originally was you wouldn't worry about storage. But um, so the idea is we just thought in terms of tables and rows and then let the database system figure out how to actually write that to disk. Well, that's theory, then there's reality. Sometimes we do care about uh, the physical storage aspects. So um, when that is the case, uh, usually is when you have really huge amounts of data. And what does really huge mean? Well, generally the rule of thumb is uh, when your table size is getting up uh, uh, beyond the size of you have uh, the amount of RAM you have, just generally. So when you start getting such huge amounts of data, then you might want to th think about partitioning. But let me give you the caveat. There's a lot of restrictions on partitioning in Postgres, so you really need to study it before you start doing it. And it is kind of a last resort from what I have learned. I've never used partitioning. I was kind of new to it until, uh, well, that's why I do these talks, to force myself to get into these technical areas. So I was a little, I mean, at first it was a very cool idea that what you can do is, um, uh, well, there's two major reasons to do the partitioning. One benefit is query performance, but the one I was just thinking of was uh, you can direct data into different storage. So if you have, if you know that most of the time you're only using this year's data, you might want to put that on really fast SSD storage, and then all the old previous years you can put on some cheaper, slower storage. That's one thing you can do as part of partitioning. But the major benefit is uh, query uh, performance. Um, so the partitioning actually creates uh, related <coughs> tables, subtables. So those subtables can have their own indexes. So when you're doing queries that only affect one partition, you're only using that partition's uh, index. So you've got less, uh, the whole index can fit in memory, you're not pushing the limits of memory. Um, that's kind of the upside. The other one is, the last one I mentioned is the bulk load. There's actually some commands uh, for attaching and detaching whole partitions. So it's one way to basically uh, suddenly include a bunch of data or, or exclude it by dropping, not dropping, you're detaching a partition. So it's still in the database, but it's not part of the master uh, parent table. So um, 
the old way, there was partitioning sort of in many years ago, and what you did was through inheritance. So there's this inherits keyword in Postgres, and um, the, the, you could connect the tables that way, but then to get the data, they call it routing, the row uh, routing. To get the row to go to the right table, for example, here we're talking about 2006, the month of February, you had to write your own code to do this create or replace uh, function to do a trigger that every time the row is being inserted into the, ta the master table, your trigger kicks in and says, no, if it's in February, I want to put it into this other table. So it worked, but you had to do the work yourself of writing that code. So in Postgres 10, they had the new declarative partitioning. So now you could say, um, I just want to partition by range based on this order date. And then you create the other related table. And the four values from does all the work we just saw in that trigger. So now you're not writing the code. This is doing the, uh, the same effect. But very simple uh, definition on your table. So they call this auto routing. So now the rows automatically, when you're inserting into the table, it looks to see on this column, if it meets these values, it needs to go into this other partition table. So what if, you do, what if you're partitioning everything by year? We used to do that. We had every year was a partition. Yeah. Back for 50 years. Yeah. And so you'd have. So you have a parent table, yeah. like the orders, but then you can de define each year range. Uh -huh. So you say from January to the end of the year, December yeah. 31st. Okay. And then you would do that for or you know orders 2018, orders 2017, orders whatever. So the name obviously doesn't mean anything except to humans. Doesn't mean to Postgres. Postgres is doing this work for you. Right. It's every time you insert, it's checking the value in this column for these values, and then routing the row to the right subtable. Basil? Yeah. After the table has been created, um, what does the table schema look like? Uh, what do you mean schema? Oh, you mean the column definitions on the table? Yeah. Does, it show, uh, or does it show? I don't know. I've never tried it. Or anything like that? No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you mean how they're implementing it? I have no idea. Yeah. Yes? Are you able to, like, Oh gosh, I don't know. Do you mean to like manage to that's over that's metadata? Just asked about yeah, 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 the metadata on it. No, because yes, at some point you'd like to be able to query and find out for this master table what are all my partition tables. Yeah, There's no, I don't know about that. I bet if you did a Google search, there'd be an answer on uh, Stack Overflow or something. Yes, <laughs> although again, <laughs> relatively new. Back slash G would have something. Yeah, oh, it's cool. probably yeah. going to query the. I mean, the, the schema tables, the backing ones. But this is new, remember, so you may not find a lot yet. This is only in 10 that the declarative partitioning came out. So what's new, one of the things that's new in 11 is that in 10, there were two different modes. Uh, we saw the range, where you specify a range of dates or something like that. Uh, the other one was list. And in this, you actually hard code the values. So for example, if you're doing states, state or province for an address, you could say that in my subpartition for Pacific Northwest, I want to put in any time the state is Washington, Oregon, Idaho, or BC, I want to direct those into one particular partition table. So that's hard coded in your list right here as part of your definition on the table. What's new is the new hash. Although I don't really like the word hash, this isn't really true. What it's really doing is just a modulus and remainder. So this is just to divvy up. Uh, you're just creating buckets, not based on the logic of the data contained. You just want, if you have ginormous amounts of data and you just want to create smaller physical tables and storage, then you can do, if you want to do three subtables, you do modulus three and then, well, here I'll show you the code. So that's just poor man sharding. Yes, yes. So it has to be an end value? Yes. So you're doing the modulus, remainder zero, remainder one, remainder two, three possible remainders. So I've got client zero, clients one, clients two. Actually, that would work pretty good for high volume inserts. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole point is when you have huge amounts of data, but you want to physically store them in, in smaller amounts, smaller tables. So for some people, this makes a lot of sense. It's kind of a different purpose. The other one, business-wise, uh, uh, I mean, if you have a business rule, it makes sense to use the other the range feature. 
but if you've just got a whole bunch of data and you want to chop it up, this will do the job now. And it's very easy. Um, as we just talked about, uh, one, of the, one of the benefits you get by keeping smaller table sizes is maintenance operations like the vacuum will run faster when the subtables are, are smaller. So other stuff, uh, we got on update. Um, uh, oh no, this is related to this. Uh, on update now, the old way didn't move the uh, rows automatically between partitions. So now, if you do an update and you're changing the value, like the date we had stored it in the year 2018, well, if you change it to be a year 2019, now that row will actually be moved from one subpartition to the other subpartition. Um, and related to that is now the uh, upsert feature. Now that works, does the same thing, moves it. Uh, oh yeah, there's a caveat. Um, uh, there were some limitations on this. Again, there's a lot of limitations with partitions, so you really need to study the docs. Uh, uh, yeah, there's this default one. So the idea um, was if your rules, if none of your rules for the subpartitions apply, you can now specify that you have this other partition that's like the catch-all, the default. Uh, some people said that it is um, not really practical right now because there's some locking issues uh, when you're, when, uh, for rows going into the default. So again, study the docs on that. One guy you called it just a cute feature that's not really practical at all right now. Um, <clears throat> really important for these partitions is now there's referential integrity. You couldn't do that before. Um, you couldn't create the indexes, now you can. <coughs> you couldn't have index on it. And um, so you couldn't create foreign keys. Now you can do all of that. So it makes this much more practical. So before it was, uh, well, basically unrelated tables, and the only ones that could be uh, partitioned. So that's huge. Um, uh, for me. Oh, yes. So this helps for um, uh, queries. So now the planner is smart about uh, looking for identifying when it's planning out your query, it can figure out that some of the partition tables relate to the query and some don't. So it's now smarter about just ignoring entire partitions. And so therefore, your query will go faster because there's a lot less data and less indexes being considered. So this is the usual thing in Postgres, where they uh, introduce features, they get them working, and then they build on them. So step by step, this makes sense that now the planner can make use, uh, can make more sense out of the partitions. So this is a more sophisticated implementation of uh, what used to be the check constraints. Um, no, it sounds like no, this, this is the query planner being improved. Yeah, the query planner itself is being smarter yeah. about looking at well, the partitions. I think I get what you're saying. You were talking about the check constraints on the partition. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so if you could take account for that, then they're doing the similar kind of work. Um, oh, this, yeah, again, more caveats. This feature is only applies to the select. So the update and deletes are not going to be as smart about ignoring partitions. Which makes complete sense following the check constraints. Mm, OK. Uh, Oh yeah, and I saw this, here's a link. This guy gave a nice example where um, you can turn the pruning uh, um, off and on and then use explain to actually look at the query and see that it's ignoring some of the uh, partition subtables. Um, there's some stuff about joins. Um, the joint, again, it's getting smarter with the partitions. So now it's able to do some of the aggregates, and um, um, the query planner can be smarter and faster with uh, making this stuff happen on the aggregates. And uh, this is a kind of a sum, summation of everything uh, we've said before that primary keys, forward keys, index, and triggers are, you can now do these on the master table. That this, again, this used to be one of the annoying things with the partitions is you had to create an index on each one of the individual partition tables, which uh, is not only annoying at first, but then you have to remember to do it if you add partitions, you gotta remember to go add the index on it. 
Well, now in 11, that work can all be done uh, automatically. If you define it on the parent table, it gets, uh, uh, you know, bleeds through to all the partitions every time you add them. So again, much simpler now. Um, here's some of the links. Um, this guy Herrera did, uh, I don't know if he did the work, but he, he presented really well on this. Um, and also I have a tip. In his documents and elsewhere, I have links to the actual source code and dev files. And I found the comments at the top are actually really helpful. They usually put a two, you know, one, two or three paragraphs of a little summation, sort of justifying uh, the code uh, patch, and that was actually uh, useful to me. Uh, oh, here's a palette cleanser. We're about to switch topics. Uh, this is Puerto Rico. I got interested in this, well, because of tax. I started reading about these amazing tax benefits in Puerto Rico. They're almost too good to believe, but apparently they are true. And, um, and then it became in the news because certain political leaders keep forgetting that Puerto Rico is actually part of the U.S. You can actually, it's the one place in the Caribbean you don't need a, a passport for. You can just fly in. Um, it's a domestic flight. I think even Southwest flies there. And if you check out the climate data, I've never seen a place that had flat climate all year long. It's like every month is basically the same. Yeah, no, maybe it's above 80. Okay, well, let me go back. Wow. So what kind of taxes can I save? Yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, maybe we should oh, it's amazing. Amazing. Uh, start over there. <laughs> Just like tax haven, Puerto Rico, totally yeah. legal, totally legit. All right. And they started a few years ago, and it's like, uh, basically, if you're bringing business into Puerto Rico, they have their own tax system. The IRS doesn't generally apply. Yeah. They have very high income taxes, but they're waiving those if you're bringing business in. Cool. And then if you're taking dividends from earnings, uh, um, then instead of a salary, then those are tax free. I mean, it goes, it's really quite amazing. There's, there's so a Joe out. Rogan episode of his podcast with Peter Schiff. Yeah, yeah, yeah he Peter Schiff. The, the thing is, you can't have like, I think you, you can't still have a house in the U.S. or a spouse. Yes, you have to be a resident. Place. Yeah, you have to be a resident. You and totally move there. It's strict. Yeah. So it's same thing on your house. You can sell a house and keep avoid capital gains, but you got to actually you don't actually have to be there all the time. Yeah. But this they did make rules really specific. You do have to be in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't sound like a bad place to me, except for the hurricane. There was a lot of damage. Anyway, so now <laughs> next feature. Um, uh, uh, da, 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 default tire rolling. Yeah. Oh, so yes. That's the so this is really neat. Them. When you add a column to the tables, um, if you specify a default value, the old way, Postgres went in and did a whole table rewrite and added that value into all the existing rows that you have in the, in the table. And now it's really neat because they set the default aside uh, in the um, metadata somewhere. So then every time you touch a row, uh, when you load fetch a row, it actually just plugs the value in to the return value. But it, I don't think it even rewrites the row. So it looks to you as if that value is in the row, but it isn't really physically until you do an uh, uh, update on the row. And then it's going to stick that value in there. So that's pretty neat. It means that you can add a column with the default value and there's no impact on performance at all immediately. If you do a, if you do a rewrite on the whole table, like, um, oh, I don't know, some of the utility commands that force tables to be rewritten, then it will take that value and write it into all the rows, which makes sense. It's already rewriting the table, so you might as well write the physical values in. So that is um, kind of a small feature, but actually kind of, uh, so Very practical. What's that? It's a big deal in production. Yeah, exactly. Big deal in production, yeah. Um, uh, oh, this is about what I was just saying. So they stored in the catalog somewhere, and um, uh, oh, it can be a dynamic expression, too. So, so this was kind of interesting. The value current the expression time when you set the default? Uh, like, how would that work on the, when you're on doing the writing it, it later case? Uh, it actually made sense when I was reading about it. They, um, uh, oh, the value's captured. So what it does is capture that. It's as if you had written it into the, into the, into the records. So it stores in the catalog the, the value at the moment when this command executes mm -hmm. to, cre to create the column, add the column. It keeps the snapshot of the timestamp. 
writes it into the catalog, so it's as if you had written it into the data. So you're getting that old timestamp uh, when you retrieve the records. Right, right. And then if the when the when you do a rewrite on the records or, or an update on it, it's going to uh, recalculate the values. So it made sense. It's like it's. In other words, it's an entirely transparent feature. You don't have to think or worry about it. It's as if you wrote the values into the, the records themselves. This sounds like a variation of PG Repack. Oh, don't know about that. Well, Repack, it, it, it repacks a table by copying it and then switching. Oh, OK, yeah. So this is like avoiding the need to do that when you're adding the columns. No, if you add the feature of altering the column on the table that you're copying, yeah. and then you switch it, you wouldn't notice. Uh, yeah, same effect, right, right, right. Another palate cleanser, cockatiels. I'm taking care of somebody's cockatiel, and I never thought I was a bird person, but they're kind of neat birds. I had no idea they have so much personality. Um, they, um, they're very social. Although all of these guys have their crest up, which is not good. That means the bird is alerted or, or stressed and nervous. When their little uh, crest goes down, that's when they're relaxed. So the next heavy topic is LLVM. And I only really want to get into it just because I, there's one feature right now in Postgres, but I have a feeling you'll see more and more of this in the future. So LLVM is a whole new kind of compiler technologies. And um, it is, well, the first bullet says it's a uh, 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 collection of modular reusable compiler and tool chain technologies. I think it's a lot of layers. Uh, what this guy did, Chris Latner, is that he broke apart uh, and rethought through the whole compiling uh, process. And um, he, it has a lot of different uses. So for example, I know a fellow who actually runs a software company. They build a tool called, it used to be Real Basic, now it's called Zojo. So they built their own language, their own compiler, um, and uh, did all the work, everything themselves. Well, now they are switching to LLVM because now their their version it's kind of like a um, real you can think of it as real base or uh, Visual Basic done right, so uh, it's fully object oriented. So now they can focus on just the language part, and they're using LLVM to actually do all the compiling stuff. And on top of that, uh, LLVM is amazing because <laughs> it makes the compiler technology makes smaller executables faster. It build, the builds are faster, but the result is actually smaller, and usually that's a trade off. Um, so this model, if you start looking and searching for LLVM, you'll find it's affecting all corners of the industry right now. So one of the, one of the versatile uses is that last bullet. You can use it to make um, a lightweight JIT, which is a just-in-time compiler. So at runtime, you look at, at source code or inter intermediate source code, and then you compile it native on the fly. Um, and you can do that for an embedded language inside some other product. Well, that is exactly what Postgres is doing. Oh, let me say, to me, this is one of the biggest leaps in compiler technology since uh, 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 Grace Hopper invented the concept of compiling. Maybe you could put the GNU GCC stuff in between. I'd say there's like three major leaps, uh, and LLVM is, is the third major leap. What about the, does LLVM do garbage collection? Um, no, no, it's no, not, it's yeah, the LLVM sort of used to stand for low-level virtual machine, and uh, like although it doesn't officially, LLVM is just its own name, um, but it's not a runtime virtual machine like the Java virtual machine is. So how does Postgres? So it's still building static code uh, at the end. So you're getting a regular native type app at the end, whereas it doesn't. Uh, so for example, this fellow, Chris Latner, also invented the Swift language. Um, so while he was hired at Apple to redo all their compiler technologies and transition them over, and in the middle of that, he also <laughs> managed to invent the Swift language. So they have their own runtime to do their own kind of reference counting and stuff, in, um, that, uh, similar to what's done in Objective-C. So that's all part of the, the stacks. It's not like automatic free. It's going to be part of whatever language or runtime you're building. So anyway, what, um, uh, to use the feature in, uh, well, in Postgres, all it's being used for right now is certain expressions in the where clauses and some of the other uh, calculating aggregates and such. There's now, you can optionally have uh, Postgres switch over to use LLVM for that. 
But to do that, you're going to have to add the dependencies into your uh, project, and you have to turn on the feature or the setting. You can do it by session, so you can actually experiment with it if you want to, and just do it by session, or you can do it for the database settings. So like I said, it's kind of small right now, but I think you'll probably see more and more of this. Uh, if you want to know about LLVM in general, the Wikipedia page is pretty useful, and they have a, a website uh, for technical info. Um, it's all completely open source, too, by the way. Apple's responsible for a lot of it, but they have completely open sourced all of it, and there's even, I think, a, a, a governance structure for LLVM that's outside of Apple. Now, the palette cleanser, uh, if you haven't ever taken it, it's pretty fun to do the Amtrak Cascades train. It goes down the coast, and there's actually a stop in Bellingham, uh, downtown. Uh, stored procedures uh, is the, tech, is the uh, usual buzzword for this. It's an expansion of what Postgres is doing on the server side now, server side code. Uh, before, in 11, we had functions, which is just a named piece of code, and it returns a value, and it runs automatically within whatever transaction is calling that function. Uh, so it's great, you do all kinds of powerful things. Now, you can now commit or roll back the transaction inside this procedure, the code that you're writing on the server side. Um, and you can also do uh, multiple result sets. Uh, but the major thing is this transaction stuff. So here's some code. Um, uh, did I do that right? Yeah. Um, so there are some new commands. Uh, this, oh yeah, SQL compliance. So these commands are defined in the SQL standard. Create the procedure, replace it, uh, alter it, or drop it. And then you call it just, instead of doing a select with functions, you do select, and then whatever, you know, get my current timestamp or whatever, parentheses. Instead, now you do this call as a keyword, and then the name of your uh, procedure. Um, let's see. Oh, the SQL standard, this is kind of complicated stuff, you know, talking about uh, arguments and, and calling code. So it's somewhat compatible with the other databases, um, and they may be doing variations. So it's not 100% portability between projects, but it'll get you very close to that. Uh, oh, and I was surprised to see this is working for all languages that come with the core distribution. So PL, PGSQL, Perl, Python, Tickle, they are all supported by this, uh, where you can write procedures in any one of those uh, languages. This command will be a little different. You know, there's some like, for Python, it's like PyCall or something like that. Um, they all have a way to do the, the call command. So here's an example I just stole from somebody uh, on the internet. Uh, you create a table, we got a column, an integer column. <coughs> so what we can do is we are entering, um, oh, we're doing a thing where we, if it's an even number, then we want to save it to the database. If it's an odd number, we want to cancel the transaction. So here we're doing an insert, which is automatically starting a transaction. And then we're either committing that transaction or we're rolling back that transaction. So this is what you could not do in functions in the old days. So that will literally just insert all the even numbers and skip the odd numbers? Yes. Yep. And you can run it. I ran it. And sure enough, yes, uh, you get the even numbers. Okay, so are they, would they be under the same transaction number, or are they different transaction numbers? Uh, I think here you're getting a new transaction every time you do an insert. Okay. Right? So it's going to be a whole new, you're automatically getting the auto. I wasn't aware that inserts would automatically start a transaction. If you don't have one going, you're always in a transaction in Postgres. Yeah, but I'm used to the database logic where if you run an insert command, it's both a beginning and an ending of the transaction on that single command. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Um, yeah, but when you do it inside a function call, historically that's been one transaction. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, prolonging. So I see what you're saying. You think of the transaction as having resolved here? Yeah, um, but it's actually expanding yeah, up to the procedure. Yeah, it's not. Right? I hadn't thought of that. You're right. That's interesting. All right. The transaction is, is pending. So it knows if there's no commit or rollback that it immediately commits the insert? 
I think the logic would be that if you don't have a commit or a rollback, it would commit at the end of your procedure. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting thought too. I hadn't thought of that. If you, you know, don't call commit or rollback, what's the behavior? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm dealing with a lot of OLAP and OLTP conflict at the same time. Using this would uh, have a good handle on these long running and uh, analytical transactions. That yeah, you'd like to checkpoint. Well, just basically get the fuck out of the way so that the other transactions can, can do their thing. <clears throat> Oh, so it's not as long running. Yeah, this would also decrease the amount that is being appended with each transaction. Mm -hmm. um, there is caveats to this since it's a new new feature. Um, you can't call it from in a, a procedure that's called from another procedure. You can't do this uh, uh, um. transaction control stuff. So it has to be. It has to be the top level procedure that got called. It's the only one that can do the commit and rollback. Really you can't know. do it recursively. What's that? You can't do it recursively. Yeah, recursively, no. I really hope they fix that for 12 because what would make a lot more sense is if each function was its own transaction isolation layer. Yeah, uh, again, Postgres always builds, start simple, make sure it's rock yeah. solid and working before they start making Although it more I complicated. Although I would like a way so. to declare um, recursive functions or sub-functions to say, no, no, if I'm already within a transactional instance, I'm not touching it. Mm. Mm. You could hack your way through it. It would be delayed. Uh, here's some more couple links on this uh, uh, from the second quadrant guy. Another palette cleanser. These are RB, class B RBs. Um, class B is when you take an existing van and inside, so you buy an empty van from the maker and then they build inside of it a whole RV. I was actually very interested in this and almost bought one of these. It's a, it was an American company that got bought out by Germans and um, during, those, during those two to three years is when I got interested in this and then a big American company, Thor, that does Airstream and all, went to buy out all of the German worldwide did their due diligence and found a $100 million embezzlement in this company. They were, apparently the Germans did not have tight oversight over the American uh, company and these guys were doing false invoices. And I'm dying to see the, um, having done a lot of uh, business apps, invoice and uh, type stuff, they did a whole bunch of generating fake invoices. So I'm hoping it goes to court and I can see the court documents because I'd like to know how they executed these um, you know, how the investment actually worked. Uh, how they were like billing the other parent company, apparently. Anyway. So, from what I'm getting here, everything put together in your presentation. <laughs> you are a DPA contractor. You go and live in Puerto Rico. You buy one of these things and call it a permanent residence. Try to live tax free. You bring it to the birds. No, even better. You only have to spend half the year in Puerto Rico. So, the other half, you could travel and drive up to Canada. Go to PG Con, then work your way back down in your RV, and then fly back over during the city. Right, yeah, 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 Stick the thing back on a container ship <laughs> back to Puerto Rico. <laughs> Did you see that article about how people were just touching down for five minutes a day in Puerto Rico? Oh, geez. Yeah, so I've heard the rich people get off their plane and you go to Starbucks and you get a receipt, and then you get back on your plane and you go to some other island. Yeah. <laughs> Figure out a way to get some going with the, uh, yeah. So there's a couple parallelized, parallelizing features. You know, Postgres has some old roots, so it hasn't been you know real savvy about getting uh, making use of all the multi-core machines that we have now. So they're adding those features in now. So that's this is parallelizing is all about making use of the cores, the multi-core processors now. So one of them, well, it's kind of a big deal actually, is the create index. Um, this works only for the B tree indexes, but uh, some of the um, examples they were looking at uh, doubling or tripling the build on an index. So you say create index, it now will chop up the work into multiple cores and build up the index, uh, pull it all together across multiple uh, cores. So that is, like I said, real world, two times to three times faster maybe. Um, this has to do with how many workers uh, if you need to understand a little um, work, a little uh, Googling and learn about the worker and leader processes, the way Postgres does this multiple uh, uh, assigns the work out to cores, 
but basically each worker is, is happening on a core, and what controls it is the amount of RAM that you have. So right now there's not a lot of control over this explicitly, and that's this comment here about um, deciding how many workers to use is kind of primitive. What they do is look at the amount of memory. Every uh, worker needs at least 32 megs, so that kind of implicitly controls how many of these you can have. So I think you'll see features you know, in the future that, that uh, you may have other workers in Postgres doing other work on the cores, so you don't want to go crazy with this. You want to have some constraints over the amount of workers that are being assigned out to the cores. Um, otherwise, you're just going to be thrashing, uh, trying to, if you have too many workers all trying to get to the cores at the same time, you're not going to, it's not going to do you any good. Um, but right now, this is like a built-in automatic feature, I believe. You don't even have to turn it on, if I remember right. The other parallelizing is um, about the hash joins. And this, uh, this was very interesting. I didn't know about all this. There's three strategies for doing joins in Postgres. So uh, there's three technical types. The third one, hash, is the only one that is being parallelized right now. And um, this is where it kicks in. It's for joins where you don't have an index. Um, or joins across whole tables where the sequential access means random access. So it's not, um, hash is not being used all the time, but when it is being used, they are now splitting it out to multiple cores. And it's a little hard for me to figure out exactly what kind of benefit, but it's like multiple fold. Um, so when you're joining across tables, sometimes in some conditions, you're going to see a big improvement in performance. Report generation. Yeah. So again, this is the kind of thing that will be. Um, expand in the future, I'm sure. And there was an incredibly technical blog post from this guy. He goes into extreme detail all about these join strategies. So if you're kind of curious about how joining works, the technical intricacies, I would recommend this blog post. Only if you don't have Netflix. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if Netflix is down. <laughs> um, uh, again, this is another automatic feature. You don't worry about it. You're just getting it, uh, as far as I know. Uh, another palette cleanser. I have a friend who's getting it, was into bird keeping, had a lot of wild birds in the yards, and now she's doing mason bees. Turns out they're native to the Northwest. There's a really interesting article in Seattle Times I linked. And they're different from honeybees because they don't make uh, a big hive. You know, if you're doing it as an amateur, that would be a bro mess having hives and honey and everything. They don't make honey, they collect pollen, and they put their little babies in a tube, and then they block each baby bee uh, and put leave pollen behind for when they hatch out of their little larvae shell or whatever. Uh, you can tell I was not a biology major. But when the little bee comes out and eats the pollen um, um, uh, to keep them alive, and then they break their way through the little shells. So they need little tubes. So there's this guy in Woodenville, engineer, who somehow got into this and taught people how to do these little uh, tubes. The bee goes in there and does her business on her own, no hive, no worker bees. And the males are pretty much useless. They just mate and they die. That's all they do. So the females do all the work. It's a lot of. Is it just for fun? There's no like harvesting honey or anything? Oh, they're great pollinators. That's why people like them. So they're pollinating without you having a whole mess of honey. And they're not aggressive. Yes, they're, they're very mild. So they won't sting. They almost never sting. And if they do, it's more like a mosquito bite than a bee sting. So this would be great for farms. Farms, orchards. Well, or urban. Yeah. It's really good for the urban type stuff because you don't have the danger of uh, stinging and uh, they're pollinating trees if you if you need that. Urban gardens. Yep. Yep. Can they Fruit trees. Anaphylaxis? What's that? When they do sting, can they induce anaphylaxis? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. They're yeah. very different from honeybees, so it might be different. Well, if it's not more than a mosquito sting, I doubt there's much venom going in. <laughs> well, my friend got one of these at Costco, I think. And then mail order from Woodenville. Uh, it's just chilled. They get a little box, so you stick them in the fridge, and um, and then you pull them out, and they come back to life. <laughs> okay. um, uh, and that's all you do. You just set them out in a little box, and then they move into the apartments there, and you're done. That's all the work you have to do. So configurable wall file. This is a really practical feature for some people. I uh, could actually use that. Yeah. Again, uh, it's a production type. Uh, can be really useful in production. So um, the right-hand wall, the right-hand log, the wall file, the size is fixed uh, in the old days to 16 megs. Well, now you can actually um, uh, 
uh, change that, and you can do it with init DB. So when you define your database, you can actually test this argument. And here's an example of doing that. init DB wall seg size 32 megs instead of 16 megs. Um, I would be interested to see what the different uh, performance things look like on real world databases. Um, like if a smaller one makes sense if you have very light work on the database. Yes, a large exactly. One That's why I've been in a situation them. working with people where we wanted smaller ones because we want the log um, to, to be over. right to be sent over. For example, if you're doing replication stuff, you wanted to get over more often. Mm -hmm. So if you're not writing a lot of data, smaller gets it over to the other database faster. Exactly. Uh, and likewise, there's times when you want it to be much bigger too. So this is not like any one rule. It's not like everybody should make it bigger. It's like you would have a specific need why you would change the size of the log file. And it's now covered in the manual. That chapter 30 talks about it. Scram, you may or may not remember, Scram is a new, much more secure method for making your connections, your session connections to Postgres. And um, the problem was it was, had limited um, implementations in the libraries for making connections. But I think that's expanded recently. Uh, like I use Java and JDBC drivers. I think there now is Scram support in the JDBC driver. Um, so the whole point is to avoid things like uh, man in the middle um, attacks. So what's new, they already have Scram in Postgres 10. But in 11, they made it even more secure um, with a little tweak. Uh, and again, there's a blog post if you want to know the details. But if you're not aware of Scram, I highly suggest you look into it if you have any security concerns about your connections to Postgres. Um, ah, covering indexes, okay. So there's a new word, include. When you do create index, you can now say include, and you specify one or more columns to be part of that. And the whole point of this is get index-only scans so that you can actually get the results of a query without actually touching the tables. So the way it works is it copies the values from whatever whatever one or more columns you pass to the include, copies the data into the index. So now it can actually use the data in the index rather than having to go to the table. The downside is in your index could be a lot bigger. So yeah, there's trade-offs to think mm -hmm. about. And the other caveat is only on vtree index. I but the, there are certain times when this is incredibly um, uh, big improvement for speed, for so performance. So really lets you define a subset of the table to include in the index itself. Yes, you can do one column or multiple columns whose data will then be copied into the index, the physical index itself. <coughs> now what that means is, yeah, what that means though is um, uh, you know, there's a little bit more work going on when you update records. It's going to have to take that data, find it in the index, and rewrite it so that well, you're you want to rewrite <coughs> the index anyway. So in, yeah, inserting and yeah, but now there's a little bit more work because it's actually copying data into the index too. <coughs> so that is a, um, uh, there, again, it's only going to be on vtree indexes. So in some cases, for some situations with some data, you're going to see a huge performance increase because you're only dealing with indexes, which hopefully might all be cached in memory. Um, so it could be tremendously faster than dealing with the records themselves. Um, oh, good. We're getting close to the end here, almost on time. SHA-2, you can leave if you have to. Uh, SHA-2 functions, there used to be just an MD5, which is good for a lot of stuff. It creates, you put in text and you get out 128-bit value. Uh, if you're doing it for security stuff, MD5 is not secure. But if all you're trying to do is generate a hash value for some reason, uh, like you want to see if two values have changed, rather than like comparing all the characters in the string, you can just do an MD5 of one and do an MD5 of the other. And if they're, if the 128 bits coming out is different, then you know that strings are not equal to each other. That kind of work. Um, now they have included the SHA-2 or um, other functions, other algorithms that are much more secure. If you are concerned about security, then SHA, the SHA stuff is much better. And there are multiple SHA commands because the output is a different bit size. You can get 220, 224 bits, 256, 384, or 512. Um, I guess they skipped SHA-1. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the history on that. SHA-2 has been out for many years, though, now. It's yeah. uh, the mainstream. There's a lot of legacy stuff. stuff that still uses SHA-1, yeah. though. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this, I think this is the, uh, oh, yes. This is the Scramite mentioned. 
they actually already had this in Postgres. They just didn't expose it. it was, this library was being used in Scram, so then they realized it was quite easy just to give that to us. It's to us. Yeah, it might be useful for yes. other people. Yes, it might be useful to other people. Right. Right. Um, right. I, I haven't looked into this, but have they changed the hash for storing passwords yet? I don't know about that. Because right now, the last time I've been looking, Um, I don't know about that. I do know in the last version they stopped, they took away the plain text version, the option to do plain text, uh, as I recall. But I don't know if they changed the, uh, the other. Um, here's the tiniest little feature in all, in all uh, of all the features that I saw. Um, people who are using PSQL, the command line interface to Postgres, apparently had a really hard time figuring out how to quit running PSQL. And the answer was you did a slash Q and then press enter. Or you could do control and D. Well, yeah, well then you're crashing out, I think, aren't you? No, no, no. So no, no you're doing crazy. It's, it's bash component. What's that? Control D is, is old school. It works. Oh, ah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was funny because when I did my Googling, I found, <laughs> I'm like, how big a deal was this? Well, if you go to Stack Overflow, there was a question with 1,700 upvotes on how do I quit PSQL, and which if you don't know, this is a lot of votes for, uh, yeah. usually votes in, are like one, two, or 10, not 1,700. Or hundreds, like low hundreds if it's a very important Yeah, question. yeah, really, yes. I've, I've almost never seen anything with 1,700, and then the answer had 2,400 uh, upvotes. Feedback so, received. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, <clears throat> Um, I saw in the commit notes, they said uh, there have been numerous requests for this feature to have a quit. And so they went all the way, not just quit or exit, they put both in. You can do either quit or exit, gets you out of PSQL now. <laughs> so small, but pretty important. So now just fin and then. Um, what's that? Oh, fin. Oh, I was just going to say, I've got oh, I fin. Yes, yeah, so if you speak French, that's the end. Um, yeah, that's the end of the talk. So. Um, uh, a couple of thoughts is, look at, there's a summary online I linked in release notes. There's also a new feature on the website of Postgres called the Feature Matrix, and it's interactive. So it's kind of funny. You can say, okay, version 11 versus 9.6, and then it shows you a whole feature list of what's different between the two. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's pretty slick. Um, I was pretty impressed. Um, so you can check that out. I don't know how extensive, how well, I just tried it briefly. And my little image there is actually kind of the theme again that the cool thing about Postgres is this gradual orchestrated evolution, version to version, and that's my overall takeaway from all of this was. You know, it's never anything too radically breakthrough. It's more evolutionary than revolutionary, which is to me the best thing about Postgres. It's very stable development. Very yeah, very cautious, build one feature after so a lot of these features are just evolutionary steps built on previous years. Yeah. I maybe getting my wires crossed with DB2, or I misunderstood the slide, but I can remember using uh, store procedures and the call syntax as far back as like 73. What was that? Which? Uh, store procedures and the call syntax. Um, I don't believe so, no. Oh, okay. No, the call, yeah. I believe call, the call command is new. Part of this, you might have used it in other systems because it is part of SQL standard. Yeah. But it's new into Postgres. The other thing yeah. is the transactional isolation is no longer defaulting to an entire call statement. It, it allows you to break it up again. Okay, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.